All right. I'd now like to uh, welcome our first group of panelists up here for the, uh, the symposium. So if they'd come on up, this, uh, this, this panel is to provide an overview of container port competition. And it was going to be moderated by uh, Monique Moyer from the Port of San Francisco. She's been taken ill, so we have my friend Peter Daly from the Port of San Francisco to be moderator. Let me give you a little background on Peter in case you don't, uh, you don't know him. Peter is a 25-year Port of San Francisco veteran, and he currently see, serves as Deputy Director Maritime and is responsible for managing and marketing one of the most varied maritime business portfolios of any port in the United States, including cargo and cruise shipping, ship repair, ferry, excursion boats, foreign trade zones, harbor services, and commercial and sport fishing. Under his direction, the port has diversified and expanded its maritime business portfolio and directs a staff that is responsible for over 7 million square feet of maritime industrial land and piers and marine terminals. Notable achievements he's made include the successful establishment of bulk cargo terminals, a major expansion of port floating dock, dry dock uh, in to handle Panamax vessels, post-Panamax vessels, Design, construction, and installation of California's first shore power facilities for cruise ships. Expansion of foreign trade zone to enhance regional economic benefits and expansion of the port ferry terminals making San Francisco California's leading passenger seaport. He is a member of the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission's Seaport Planning Advisory Committee, current chairman of the American Association of Port Authority Cruise Committee, and serves as a member of the California Association of Port Authorities Advisory Committee. I've worked for, for, uh, with Peter for many, many years, and it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have him up here. This is, this is really great. So please welcome my friend, Peter Daly. Thank you very much. It's uh, an unexpected pleasure to be here today. Uh, Monique Moyer, our executive director, unfortunately, I think caught that uh, bad flu that's been going around. And, I uh, got a battlefield promotion and am are your uh, <laughs> moderator today. So bear with me if I uh, mix up the names or so on and so forth. Um, luckily um, for you, uh, you have a, a tremendous panel here today of professionals and diplomats that are going to uh, talk to you about um, competition in the container uh, shipping world. Um, before we get to them, I want to just give a little uh, history of the Port of San Francisco. We are uh, celebrating our 150th anniversary this year. Thank God the uh, anniversary ends in April, so you won't have to hear us talk about it anymore. <laughs> but uh, we are a proud port with a proud past and, and, and a wonderful future. Um, but our panel today is going to talk about competitive measures in, in the container trade uh, that most of you, you're all the true believers of, of, the, of the freight business. We don't have to explain to you rudimentary elements of why freight is so important, why seven-eighths of everything we eat, drink, fly, drive comes in on a ship. Um, San Francisco, uh, as I mentioned, we do a lot of different things. We have uh, active break bulk uh, cargo facilities, bulk cargo. As Cassie would be glad to hear, most of our cargo comes from Canada, so we're very happy to have her on the panel today. Uh, cruise ship, we're the largest passenger port in California. We have foreign trade zones, America's Cup races, you name it, we do it. Um, but I think there's an interesting, not lesson to be learned, but I think it's important to pause and think about it for a second. Um, the Port of San Francisco was the preeminent Pacific Coast port for 100 years. I mean, San Francisco is the oldest port on the West Coast. It was it. Um, and it was it until um, after World War II. It was a major embarkation port, uh, port for uh, the war effort. And then um, things changed. Technology changed. Uh, the old finger piers that were built on the northern waterfront of San Francisco that handled the predominance of cargo on the west coast were, were suddenly obsolete. Uh, intermodal connections and double stack uh, trains became important. So I think the, the lesson, the point I'm trying to make is that what we know today, like they probably knew you know, 75 years ago at the Port of San Francisco, things can change. Competition can change. Um, uh, innovation can make very big changes to your, to your uh, infrastructure needs. Um, we cannot take what we have for granted in California. Uh, we compete uh, not only with, between other ports, between other states, between other countries, um, 
and to, to kind of sit on our hands and say, well, the, the freight's always going to have to come to California because we're California, is um, history has shown, at least has shown me, uh, that that is not the case. And I think it's important for us all to be vigilant and to remind policymakers when we're here in Sacramento that it's important that our customers be, hear, be heard and that we continue to have our competitive edge. So enough of the sermon. Um, I want to I'll introduce uh, each speaker, and then at the end, if we have time, we have some time for questions. Uh, first off, um, I'm, pr I'm happy to introduce Dick Steinke. Uh, Dick is the practice leader for Moffat Nickel uh, Marines Terminals Group. Uh, Moffat Nickel, the preeminent container terminal uh, design energy engineering firm um, in California, maybe the world. Um, he leads a global team of planners, designers, analysts, uh, in the area of port operations. Most of you, most of us know Dick from his 22 year stint at the Port of Long Beach, 14 years of which he served as the executive director. Under his uh, tenure, the port uh, saw a, a wonderful growth, uh, extraordinary growth. Uh, he had the right combination of business savvy, uh, political savvy, and community savvy to, to, sh to shepherd that growth along. Um, he has taken a lot of praise, rightfully so, for his efforts on the environmental or, and security side of the port business, the Green Port Policy enacted in 2005 when Dick was the executive director. He volunteered with the California Association of Port Authorities, the American Association of Port Authorities, and most importantly, he's just a really nice guy. So without any uh, more, I'd like to introduce Dick Steinke. Well, thanks, Peter, for that very warm introduction, and I uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, to speak with you this afternoon. A special thanks to uh, Jim Hausner and, and uh, David Hull and Norman Fastler Katz. Uh, this ha has been a labor of love for those uh, these guys uh, over the course of many years, and it, it's it's very important that uh, that we get together um, as stakeholders um, and talk about international trade and goods movement and why it's so important to the state of California. So guys, uh, thanks for your good work and, and good, uh, good work of the steering committee to continue to put this together. Um, let's see how we, how we do here. Um, and just a, just a comment. Um, uh, Peter made the comment about the, the changing uh, circumstances with California ports. And as I like to say, if you've seen one port, you've seen one port. And uh, uh, that is certainly true in California. It's certainly true uh, in other places uh, around the United States and the, and the rest of the world. But California is a good example of how things have changed over the course of many years. Uh, first, the obligatory uh, company overview. Um, just talk a little bit about Moffat and Nickel. Uh, suffice to say, we're, we're a California firm, uh, born and raised in Long Beach, California. Now we have about 30 offices, uh, mostly in uh, seaport uh, and coastal areas, uh, with about 500 employees, uh, uh, most of which are here in the United States. This is what I'd like to talk about. Um, I don't want to step on other people's toes, but uh, I think Leslie uh, le uh, uh, led us off to talk about uh, some of these things uh, that are important to, to, to discuss. Uh, shippers do have more freight routing options today. I'll talk a little bit and concentrate my efforts on, on uh, the Suez Canal. Uh, I think Dan will talk a little bit more about the Panama Canal. Uh, there's more sourcing options. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, uh, some opportunities close to the USA that are, are uh, able to uh, be competitive these days. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But most importantly, we need to talk about the fact that uh, California ports, uh, whether they are container ports or otherwise, need to continue to invest to compete. Uh, this is an important slide. Uh, larger vessels are gaining a share of the global flight, uh, the fleet. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, or Leslie talked a little bit about some of the largest vessels. The 18,000 TU vessels are now uh, in service, and this thing called cascading, where uh, they are moving the smaller ships to other trade lanes, is going to continue. If you look at the order book of the uh, container operators, these large vessels will continue to have a more dominant position with the, uh, with the uh, major routes, Trans-Pacific, uh, uh, Asia-Europe, 
um, and you can continue to see the smaller vessels go into other, other areas. Uh, as you can see, uh, Suez Canal over the last couple of years has uh, continued to, uh, to be a dominant trade lane. Uh, the largest vessels that can't go through the pa Panama Canal are now opting to go through uh, the Suez Canal. Uh, and I think it's important uh, to take note that even with the widening of the Panama Canal, the largest vessels in the trade, these 18,000 TEU behemoths that uh, are, are now calling um, and will call on California ports um, in, the, in the future, um, are going to be too wide to go through the Panama Canal even after the widening. So, uh, you know, the cargo owner wants reliability and predictability, and uh, the cargo, as, as Peter said, doesn't always have to come to certain ports. It's going to, partic uh, it's going to pick the particular port of call uh, that is most reliable and that can service their needs. This is a pretty compelling slide. I, when I talked to, to Monique about this, uh, we, we, we thought it was quite interesting. Uh, U.S. coast market share has weakened. Uh, the focus on the 2000, uh, if you focus on the 2012 numbers, and those don't pop out probably as, as much as they should, but if you look down at total U.S. West Coast uh, uh, 2012, it still hasn't regained uh, its position from 2005. Um, and if you look at particular ports like Manzanillo and Lazaro Cardenas, um, uh, they've shown, shown some tremendous upticks. And one of the most obvious ones that are, isn't even on the list, which I'm sure Cassie will talk about, is Prince Rupert. Uh, Leslie alluded to it a little bit in her comments. Uh, it doesn't make it quite up to the, the level um, uh, of, of a million TEUs, but last year, uh, it did 565,000 TEUs. And those containers came at the expense of certain U.S. Pacific Northwest and U.S. Southern California ports. What we're talking about is discretionary cargo, and I think that's one of the other points that needs to be made here is uh, there's always going to be a captive market in certain gateways. Uh, cargo uh, should be calling in Southern California to to uh, uh, service that captive market of 8 million to, to 10 million people in that local area. Uh, but there's a lot of other container volume that uh, can go to any port on the U.S. Uh, and, and Canadian uh, West Coast, and, and uh, those are the cargo containers that uh, everybody wants to chase for. So the battleground really uh, is uh, where uh, where that, that uh, ocean carrier is going to go to service those important po uh, points uh, in the U.S. Uh, U.S. West Coast ports will need to continue to be able to invest in infrastructure, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes, both on the uh, terminal land side and water side, uh, along with the road and railway in order to compete favorably for the discretionary cargo. Uh, Florida, uh, and if you've been reading, is, uh, will overtake New York uh, probably sometime this year as the third most populous state in the Union behind California and Texas. Uh, the question will be, uh, you know, what ports are going to be vying for Florida's cargo? Uh, East, East Coast ports are getting ready, um, and the question will be whether the, uh, the railroads want to give up that market share or not, uh, because traditionally uh, a lot of Florida's cargo has been served uh, uh, by U.S. West Coast ports. Uh, you can see the difference, our, our, our trade imbalance, uh, we're a service economy. Uh, we need to continue to develop our export uh, infrastructure. Uh, and I think the, the point of this slide is that, uh, you know, we, we need to continue to emphasize uh, the fact that we have a, a robust opportunity to uh, move exports but export infrastructure is different than import infrastructure. If you talk to people in the ports, they'll tell you um, you need to have uh, stronger wharves, you need to have deeper water, you need to have overweight corridors to move that cargo uh, you know, to those export ports. Um, and it's not the same as what, uh, what we've traditionally ha uh, have in, in many of the ports right now. Um, so it's important that we emphasize the type of infrastructure that's going to need to be built um, in order to, to uh, move the exports to market. 
Uh, we do have opportunities um, uh, closer to home. Uh, I think Mexico provides a, an interesting study um, as the Mequivadoras have uh, continued to blossom. Uh, the Class I railroads now, Kansas City Southern and U Union Pacific, have taken advantage of the manufacturing in Mexico. They're starting to move things in increasing numbers by rail. Uh, and so we're starting to see uh, people more bullish on the Mexican manufacturing opportunities. Um, you know, they have had some, uh, some obstacles to overcome in Mexico, but uh, we're starting to see a shift of cargo uh, from uh, places like China, which has traditionally dominated the, uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific trade. Um, and we're starting to see some things start to move through Mexico uh, with increasing frequency. Uh, you know, wage gaps between China and Mexico is closing. Uh, transportation costs from Mexico to the U United States is obviously lower, especially in the last several years as oil prices uh, have increased. Uh, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, NAFTA when Leslie made her comments uh, that they've mitigated uh, customs and border issues. Um, and I think an interesting point is that the Chinese uh, RMB or yuan has uh, become more expensive in relation to the U.S. dollar while the Mexican peso has become more, uh, has become cheaper in relation to the U.S. dollar. So we're starting to see uh, an increase um, in near sourcing, and that should provide an opportunity again for, for uh, uh, some, uh, some U.S. port activity in the export market. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip by that, uh, that slide and go to this next slide, which I think is very important. One of the things that uh, is, is uh, compromising our export opportunities um, is our inland waterway infrastructure. Uh, this is kind of a busy slide. It's got a lot of information, but the main takeaway here um, is that it's taking longer to move uh, export uh, products um, uh, along the Mississippi River, um, and we're losing some of our competitiveness to um, places like Brazil and Canada who have a much more efficient inland transportation system. Um, or uh, have lower labor costs, which mitigate some of those uh, uh, waterway uh, uh, infrastructure um, uh, processes uh, that they go through. So un un unreliable cargo movements um, add costs to the, uh, the logistics chain, and we're losing the game here in the Midwest uh, of the United States, which really uh, impacts our ability to move exports uh, to uh, uh, important places, uh, for ex example, uh, New Orleans and, and some of the uh, the other Gulf, uh, Gulf Coast ports. I think this is another slide. Most of you may, uh, may have seen this slide. This was produced by the American Association of Port Authorities, but it really indicates the challenges that uh, the ports and intermodal connectors have uh, in terms of, of uh, a lack of investment. Um, it speaks to our competitiveness uh, with other uh, countries, and uh, probably Cassie will talk about some of the successes they've, uh, they've had in Canada. <laughs> But it shows that we've got a long way to go um, in terms of investing in our ports here in the United States in order to be as competitive as we can possibly be. Uh, California's advantage, I think, in terms of being able to move containerized cargoes, both import and export, um, is that we do have uh, a number of ports uh, uh, that are big ship ready. Uh, both LA and Long Beach, Oakland have the benefits of deeper water. We have uh, uh, good railway connections for the most part, um, and uh, most of our terminals are large enough to handle uh, what will be increasing trade uh, in the future. So I think we are well positioned, uh, but we need, need to make sure that uh, California markets itself, that California uh, educates uh, not only the consumers, but the, uh, the cargo owners and the, uh, and the ocean carriers that uh, we have the facilities and the infrastructure uh, ready for the larger ships. Uh, we, we do know that uh, the 18,000 TU ships will start calling um, at these gateway ports. Uh, it's important to get ready now, and I think at least uh, uh, the three major uh, container ports in California um, are in pretty good shape with respect to infrastructure. Uh, U.S. container exports have held up better than imports. Uh, you're starting to see uh, uh, better numbers on the export market uh, overall, uh, uh, not only California ports, but other ports, especially in the southeast, 
uh, and that's an encouraging sign. But as I said before, we need to get ready uh, for uh, uh, increased input, uh, excuse me, uh, ex increased exports, um, and the infrastructure needs to, to be able to support that. So in summary, uh, shippers need to have more freight routing options. Um, uh, they will. Uh, land bridge is becoming an important part uh, to California's competitiveness. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, the Suez Canal has provided options for ocean carriers and shippers. Um, uh, it'll continue to be a viable option, even with the uh, uh, widening of the Panama Canal. Uh, we're starting to see uh, encouraging signs from Mexico in terms of its ability to near source and provide uh, uh, opportunities for American products and uh, California ports are in good position to continue to invest in order to compete in a very, very uh, competitive marketplace. That concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dick. I appreciate the comments. Uh, I noticed a few um, representatives from the California Maritime Academy out here. I, I urge you to take copious notes and because you're getting uh, three uh, experts in their fields and uh, this is like graduate work for you. Uh, our next speaker is Dan Smith uh, of the Tioga Group, uh, principal with the Tioga Group. Tioga Group is a uh, uh, consulting, transportation consulting firm uh, based in Philadelphia, but actually Dan is my neighbor. He lives down the street uh, in Moraga, California. Uh, Tioga specializes in transportation planning, economics, uh, policy. Uh, I've heard Dan speak before and give these presentations. He, he's a really smart guy, so I, I, you should try to Thanks, listen to this. He um, went to University of California, Berkeley, uh, go Bears, and I did not, but that's okay. And he's a math major, uh, of all things. I hate these kind of guys. Um, <laughs> Um, but interesting, he, uh, Monique took some notes, I guess they had an interview, and he said that he, he got the bug for transportation uh, from his grandfather, who was a train conductor for the Denver Rio Grande Narrow Gauge Railway. And then his dad worked for United Airlines in uh, SFO uh, uh, for in the maintenance area. Um, so transportation runs in, in the family. So without uh, further ado, uh, Dan Smith. Well, thank you very much. I'll get you for that later. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, up here today and to be discussing an issue that's really generated a lot of heat in recent years. I hope I can add a little light to the heat. Uh, Tioga is a little bit smaller than Moffat and Nickel. We have almost five employees, and many of them are standing in front of you here today. Um, we've all seen the pictures of the Panama Canal locks. Um, and the diagrams of the big ships that will fit through. Um, the current contractor disputes are throwing off their schedule and increasing their costs up there. But I don't think any of us are really too surprised that they've got cost overruns and delays on a monumental project like that. Um, but why should we here on the West Coast be worried? The magic scary number there is 13,000. That's the TEU capacity of the largest ships that are going to be able to fit. Uh, by the way, many of you saw earlier numbers. They talked about 12,500. Well, the marine architects went right out there with pencil and paper and designed 13,000 TEU ships that would fit through the same canals. Um, East Coast ports are frantically getting ready to handle those ships, although, as Dick noted, they have more urgent needs in dealing with big ships coming from Suez before they come through Panama. Uh, there are Caribbean transshipment ports being uh, built up in the, in the basin down there, uh, and the East Coast ports are adding capacity, all with the expectation they're going to see more cargo diverted from the West Coast. So question then, is it time for us to panic here? Well, I think not. Um, here's the points I want to make today and try to convince you um, not to panic either. Uh, first off, there's not going to be any stampede out there. The Panama Canal Commission itself is expecting relatively moderate growth, despite what any East Coast port director might tell you. Um, it's going to be a long time before anybody can actually fill a 13,000 TEU vessel between Asia and the East Coast. And when they do, interestingly enough, the customers are not going to see all of the savings. Most of what we handle at California ports um, is out of reach for the Panama Canal. Uh, the, the geography just doesn't support massive diversions. And most of what the Panama Canal can compete for is actually already moving through the Panama Canal. 
Um, as Dick pointed out, California ports can already handle mega ships, and they're already calling here. Um, and interestingly enough, neither the ports nor the railroads are interested in giving up their core business. This is the actual forecast from the, port, the uh, Can Panama Canal Commission. Uh, this is what they expect, and they're talking about 3% growth, which doesn't sound nearly as dramatic as what you're hearing from the East Coast ports. Uh, and as of last year, fiscal 2013, they are actually right on target for this growth, um, growth level. And then the other thing is container trade through the canal was actually down last year over 2012. So it's not growing like gangbusters right now. They're not filling the ships that they already have. Right now, the carriers through the Panama Canal are using 4,000 TEU vessels. Uh, at 3% growth, everybody get out your calculators, how long before you need a 13,000 TEU vessel? The answer is if just at that growth rate, it's going to take a couple of decades to fill those ships. And that's no fluke. The Panama Canal Commission is not building new locks to handle what they expect next year. They're building those locks to accommodate 20 and 30 years worth of growth. And that's how long it's going to take to really fill that capacity. Uh, focus in for a moment on the red line in that circle. That is what the Canal Commission itself expects when the new locks open. That's a bump, not a hockey stick there. Um, carriers don't leap from 4,000 to 13,000 TEU vessels. As Dick explained, and as every carrier that I've talked to has agreed, they're going to handle Panama Canal growth by gradually cascading in larger vessels freed up from other services. Um, that means they have to fill a, go from a, a 4,000 to a 5,000 to a 6,000, filling each as they go before they get anywhere near that 13,000 TEU capacity. Uh, they are buying new 13,000 TEU vessels in what's now being called the NPX class, which stands for Neo Post Panamax. Um, those ships will fit through the canal if they eventually decide to use them there. But those ships are being deployed in those other trades, in the Suez trade, the Asia-Europe trade, uh, around the world services. They're not lining up those ships outside the entrance to the Panama Canal, at least not yet because the volume isn't there yet to fill those ships between Asia and the U.S. East Coast. Uh, carriers will be able to share vessels to build some um, economies of scale, but most of the uh, services through the Panama Canal are already shared. As of last year, there were about 17 sailings between Asia and the East Coast through the Panama Canal. So there's only so far that you can condense 17 weekly sailings. And by by comparison, there's something like 29 sailings to California ports. And what we've seen in the past when we've studied alliances has been that alliance partners tend to use the new vessel capacity to serve more ports and to add services because every carrier out there wants to offer their customer a worldwide solution. So I think you're going to see more services, more frequent services through the Panama Canal before you see those big ships. Um, a couple years ago, Marad commissioned a study on Panama Canal impacts. Uh, the first phase was sort of quietly released back in November, first phase report, and I had a chance to talk to the research team uh, when, the, when the report was being put together, and this is what they told me. This is the key point they made up here. A significant amount of transportation cost savings associated with the use of larger vessels is expected to be absorbed by providers of transportation services. Another way of putting that is, yes, there will be cost savings, but everybody is going to take a cut before the customer sees the end result. Uh, the Panama Canal itself is going to keep as much as they can, uh, and the carriers want a piece too, or they will be no better off than they are right now. And the other part is those mega ships are going to call on the U.S. West Coast first, and we'll see the savings here before they're seen in the can canal trades. Uh, the Panama Canal Commission is not, oops, that didn't turn. There we go. The Panama Canal Commission is not in it for the volume. They're in it for the money, and they're very clear about that. The tolls they charge are based primarily on the vessel's TEU capacity. So there's a big chunk of change to run a big ship. The last thing you want to do as a carrier is put a big ship through the Panama Canal with only a little bit of cargo on it. You will go broke very, very quickly if you try that. 
Uh, the numbers that I've heard kicked around by the research team from Marad and from others is that eventual savings around $400 per TEU, but it'll take a couple of decades to achieve those savings. And of those savings, the guess is that the canal itself is going to take the first half and the carriers are going to take a cut before the customer ever sees the price difference. Now, the other factor is that Panama Canal services aren't new. They've been there all along. And in fact, on the East Coast, you have a very strong market share for the Panama Canal already. Again, this is the ACP's own slides. Uh, and you can see on the far right, the dark blue, it points up there that in some places on the bark, dark blue, they already have an 81% market share. You aren't going to get dramatic growth when you've already got 81% of that market. The battleground are the gray states there. And the key markets that are going to be, going to be contested is the upper Midwest, Great Lakes states, and Texas. Now, those are important markets for the West Coast, but those are not the big chunk of cargo that we have at stake here. Um, cheaper does not always get you the business either. Uh, Panama's reach is really constrained by cargo value. It takes five to seven additional days to get into the Chicago and Memphis markets from the, through Panama, uh, and four days into Dallas. The typical practice for many of the major importers we've talked to is that they continue and plan to continue to bring the high priority, high value merchandise in through West Coast and move it by faster and more reliable intermodal services, and then move the lower value, lower priority products by the all water services. The chart below is out of that Marad report. What it shows there is on the Atlantic coast for the lower value rubber and plastic products, only 37% come through the West Coast. But for the higher value electronics, 57% comes to the West Coast. And that's a pretty consistent pattern. Um, as Dick pointed out, California ports do have the capacity to handle those mega ships already where the West Coast, East Coast ports are struggling. Um, there is no congestion or shortfall on the horizon here. Uh, the ports have gotten ahead of the curve, partly because of the recession. Uh, some port projects went through and are going through now, um, which will build the capacity needed to handle any of the cargo that's on the horizon. They already have the water depths in uh, LA, Long Beach, and Oakland for the mega ships. They're calling here now, and the vessel, average vessel size in that chart for LA and Long Beach is a lot, and Oakland is a lot higher than the average vessel sizes that are calling the East Coast. And the East Coast numbers are pumped up from those larger Suez vessels. And down here you can see the Panama Canal, the average vessel size there is 1,500 TEU or something like that, less than we get on the West Coast. So in fact, we'll see those mega ships here first. We're also ahead of the curve on road and rail transport. Uh, we have gone through all the pain and agony of imposing clean truck standards. Um, that's mostly done. Uh, the East Coast ports still have to do that. They still got to go through that, that difficult period. Uh, we also have the rail capacity in place here to handle it. They don't yet. The other thing is the railroads are going to fight for that business. If they have a lot more at stake, actually, than the ports. They've got a huge amount of revenue at stake and uh, huge investments in West Coast um, International Intermodal. And in order to divert Midwest or Texas cargo from California ports, you also have to take it away from UP and BNSF. Uh, and they aren't going to give it up. They went through their own problems in uh, about five to 10 years ago in, uh, well, 2005 to 2006. They had a capacity crunch. They priced away the less profitable cargo. So the cargo they've got, the West Coast cargo they've still got, is very profitable for them. It competes well for internal investment, uh, and they're going to keep it. Uh, and as it says here, they have an unbroken record of making sure they have the capacity for the cargo they want to keep. Now, uh, it's been pointed out to me that, in fact, containers aren't the whole story. We've got a lot of bulk ports in California. Um, and the new locks are going to affect the bulk trades as well. Uh, one thing that's happened here is Northern California ports have become major gateways for iron ore out of Utah headed for China. Uh, it's been moving through Stockton, Levin Richmond terminals. Those are the, the photos above. That very ugly black stuff is iron ore. Um, the patterns have shifted over time depending upon how the uh, exporters want to load their vessels. 
But the new Panama Canal locks will also allow for greater sailing drafts out of the Gulf ports. Right now, they're constrained to about 52,000 tons in a Panamax vessel because they can't load more than 39 and a half feet through the canal. They have 40 feet of 45 feet of water at most Gulf, port, Gulf Coast ports. So with the better Panama Canal locks, they're going to be able to use their own water depth. So there'll be addition commission there, addition competition there. The other thing, though, is that the Panama Canal may give Brazilian ports a very large advantage. Whereas we've got 45 feet of water there, 35 feet, they've got 60 feet and more. They can load Cape size vessels to 80,000 to as much as 200,000 tons. It's four times what we can load right now out of most U.S. ports. Uh, and they have new iron ore projects being started up. The big um, uh, Minas Rio project is supposed to start shipping ore later this year. So there's a different factor for the bulk ports, which is not diversion, but potential loss of the markets to Brazilian ports. But back to containers. Uh, is it time to panic? No, I don't think so. Uh, the ports are very much doing their part. Yes, we will lose some marginal traffic to the Panama Canal. Uh, the diversion, however, I think is going to be slow uh, and small. Uh, the East Coast ports are right to be pushing for dredging, and I don't blame them a bit to be beating the drum for cargo diversion, because if they want to have the terminals and water depths ready for those big ships from wherever they come, when they come, they need to start right now, just as we need to push forward on our projects. Um, and those big ships can obviously come from other directions than Panama. Uh, but if we lose trade here, it won't be because of port capacity or water depth. But it's also not time to relax. I like um, Peter's word, uh, vigilant. Uh, the Panama Canal can't really take the cargo away from the West Coast ports or from California, but we can certainly lose it to someone if we're not paying attention. Uh, this flyer up here came in the mail while I was putting together these slides. It is an Ace Hardware DC in Virginia. It took nine months from uh, cleared ground to a uh, DC up and running. And if I am a very frustrated vice president of distribution in California, this looks really good to me. And so this is part of the danger here. Uh, we really need to keep California and California ports in the lead. Um, perception often trumps reality here. And all the numbers that we put up don't mean a lot if to importers and exporters, California becomes a difficult and unreliable place to do business. And whether that's the infrastructure, the business climate, the ports, whatever. Nothing will turn off vice presidents of distribution like hassles, headaches, unreliability. They can cope with changes in cost. They much rather cope with that than with something that's perceived as unreliable or uncooperative. So, and if that cargo moves for those kinds of reasons, then all the super Panamax cranes in the world won't pull it back. Uh, we need the business here. Uh, trade is a huge industry in California. Um, and we need to support it as much as we support any other cornerstone of the economy here. Um, the truth is, we've got maybe a million jobs at least dependent on the imports and exports moving through California ports, and we need to defend that as a state. Um, this is all part of the threat. This is another one. This is a nice brochure that I pulled out of the middle of the Journal of Commerce. Uh, it has nice diagrams of all the new infrastructure projects for the Port of New York and New Jersey. Eric, there's no picture of your bridge here. There's their bridge, but not our bridge. We need to tell our story better. Um, because if the distribution center goes to the East Coast, then the cargo goes, canal or no canal. Uh, the ports are doing their job on their own internal infrastructure side. Uh, we need to back them up on the land side so that the land side of the move works just as well as the water side. As um, Leslie said earlier, that means we need to deliver on the road and infrastructure and IT projects to keep that trade moving safely, cleanly, and efficiently for both the trade customers and for the communities around the ports. Um, you heard from Leslie earlier, and you'll hear in, in a couple minutes again here, about how seriously British Columbia and Canada um, take that challenge and how much they have done to tackle that, um, that chore. Um, if you had sharp eyes on Dick's chart, with all the numbers, you would have seen that the big winner in trade growth on the West Coast was Vancouver. Uh, 
we need to be just as serious about it as they are if we're going to stay in this game. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, very illuminating comments, and I hope everybody's taken this to heart, and we'll talk to their uh, policy makers uh, when you see them this evening at the reception. Um, speaking of Canada, uh, our next speaker um, is the Council General, Cassie Doyle. Um, she was appointed Council General uh, for, of Canada for, and she's got a great duty, Northern California, Nevada, Hawaii, Guam. So that means Tahoe, Vegas, Honolulu, <laughs> Sacramento. Um, and, uh, you know, our, a lot of our focus in, in, in international trade seems to be with Asia, as it ought to be. You know, everybody's talking about trans-Pacific trade and the Pacific Rim and so on and so forth. But it's important to remember that um, U.S. and Canada have the largest trade relationship in the world. Uh, they're our biggest trading partner. I think if I wrote, it was on the Internet, so it's got to be true. $680 billion worth of trade in 2011. And one a little factoid that I thought was really interesting, that trade between Canada, b between um, the, uh, on the uh, Windsor, Ontario, and Detroit uh, on the Ambassador Bridge is equal to the trade between the U.S. and Japan. That, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty amazing. And in California, U.S. trade uh, with Canada, um, uh, 7.1 million U.S. Uh, are, are jobs are, are actually nationally, 7.1 million jobs are created because of trade between the United States and Canada. And the, the, the state with the highest trade number of jobs generated by trade with Canada is, it's not Washington, it's, it's California with about 832,000 um, uh, workers. So it's an important connection that we have and I'm looking forward to hear Cassie's comments. She's a native of uh, the west coast of Canada. She has served at the executive level of all three orders of government including as deputy minister uh, with both the governments of Canada and British Columbia. Over the last 15 years, she's led departments that have focused on advancing Canada's energy, natural resource, and environmental agendas. Um, Ms. Doyle uh, achieved notable success in the development of clean energy innovation and efficiency programs, improvements in the performance of government's regulatory system for major projects, that's very impressive right there. Uh, proven track record with collaborating with stakeholders um, through uh, a spectrum of uh, public and private non-government sectors. She holds a master's degree in social policy and administration from Carleton University and a bachelor degree uh, in sociology from the University of Victoria. Uh, please welcome Cassie Doyle. Good afternoon. If there's one thing that wasn't on that, my bio, is that I never did have the opportunity to work in the area of transportation. But I am delighted to be here today to talk to you about Canada's Gateways and Corridors initiative. And I think what's really important to, as a kind of context, to understand um, why Canada is putting so much emphasis into our transportation system, it's because we are a major trading country. If you think of our population, which is less than California at about 36 million, and the size of our market, we are very reliant on trade. About 60% of our GDP and 20% of our jobs um, are, are as a result of our export markets internationally. So that kind of focuses the mind um, when it comes to our future prosperity as a country. Um, and, and as you mentioned, Peter, we do have, we have, are celebrating 25 years of the first free trade agreement between Canada and the U.S. this year. And we do have a, the largest trading relationship in the world. In the last 25 years, our, the size of our trade in goods and services has tripled. And it's now, in, as, as of uh, 2012, it's at about $750 billion dollars a year or about $2 billion a day of trade going back and forth between our two countries. So we still value the relationship with the U.S. above all others in terms of, of our trade. Now let's see, yeah. So let me just talk, just to give you a little bit of background in terms of our own current uh, national policy framework. Back in between the mid-1980s and 1990s, the Government of Canada took a, a deliberate policy to reduce the regulatory oversight of our transportation system and, most importantly, devolve the ownership of many of our transportation assets. 
So that was a period of time where we saw the commercialization and privatization of all of our ports, our airports, our railways, railways and our air carriers. So even though it's still called Air Canada, it's a privately listed company. Um, so that commercialization at the same time allowed the country to really start to understand the, emerging, uh, the emergence of an integrated global value chains. And the government took upon itself to ensure, develop a policy that would ensure we have a fluid, reliable, and efficient transportation system. And in particular to be opening up the tremendous growth in the Asia Pacific trade. There's been lots of talk here about Vancouver and um, Vancouver really came about as a result and the gateway in Vancouver as a result of Canada's national policy framework. So the government's, the gateways approach that was put in place, it, it focuses on the entire transportation system and it elaborates five key policy lenses. An emphasis on global commerce, on long-term planning, on public-private collaboration, an integrated approach to physical infrastructure, and then a use of a full range of policy, regulatory, and operational measures. The policy was developed by all levels of government and in very close cooperation with the private sector. So there's a memorandum of understanding between the Government of Canada and all the provinces, uh, which is at the same as, our, as your states. And also the policy from its inception was in, done with the engagement of private sector leaders in both the transportation and logistics industries, shippers, retailers, railways, airways. Um, it was a, a huge sort of national effort. You'll see here that the Gateway Initiative, it started back in 2008 with the Asia Pacific Gateway on the West Coast. And that aimed to take advantage of the geographic location and a more direct route between Asia and North America. Then the gateways expanded to be a national project. So on the eastern coast of Canada, the Atlantic Gateway, which is at least one day closer to Europe than any other port on the eastern seaboard and within a three-day drive to more than half the population of North America. The continental gateway, which you see in the center, is at the heart of, the, of Canada's economic center, and that is primarily focused on ensuring that the border crossings with the United States are functioning at full capacity. And of course, the modern supply chains are not just about the ports, railways, and highways. There's also, um, it's, as it's, it's about connecting all of these physical infrastructures and making sure that they work together in a coherent manner. So the framework, I guess, in a nutshell, is around optimizing, adapting, and improving. To optimize the use of existing infrastructure, to adapt the transportation system to meet future demands of freight flows and changes in supply chain and logistics, and to improve the integration between modes. Certainly in Ottawa, the big focus has always been on this integration. The policy itself is led by Transport Canada, our national um, transport department, but does involve and connect with um, the federal provincial side of government, uh, municipalities, the, the, the particularly the other side of Transport Canada, which is Infrastructure Canada. The strategy goes beyond bricks and mortar. It's also about this efficient supply chains. So the interconnected issues is, is a really important part of this strategy and also supporting gateways by aligning regulatory approaches. And that means removing, for example, and changing tariffs and modifying the customer tariff rules respecting treatment of imported cargo containers. So we have, in the last number of years, effectively completely harmonized with the U.S. on that front. It also, um, I wanted to mention that there has been supply chain security reviews for marine traffic from the ports of Prince Rupert and Montreal to the U.S. And these reviews supported an essential concept of integrated cargo security strategy, one that the President and the Prime Minister of Canada have agreed to a, a whole series that is really aimed at inspecting once on arrival in North America and clearing twice so that there'll be an easier flow across the Canada-US border. 
Uh, the system-based approach of this framework is really, it really it is the underpinning where there's a very rigorous evidence-based approach to collecting data, which monitors the fluidity of the system as a whole, which has extensive uh, collection and analysis of data on system performance. Essentially, it's, there's a tremendous amount of research that aims to better understand the factors that impact key supply chains and to identify potential options for improving the transportation system that supports them. So factors such as the identification of hotspots and key infrastructure, areas of congestion, utilization rates, and seasonal variations. All of this is part of this national s transportation system. And all of this, of course, is done in consultation with the stakeholders, with all the con component parts of the system itself. The, um, the Pacific Gateway, as I mentioned, and there's been some discussion on that, was the first of the gateways. And it really is a model of this integrated, multimodal, public-private strategy. Since 2008, the transportation network that developed includes roads, transcontinental rail systems, modern international airports, and two deep water ports, one in Prince Rupert and one in my hometown, Vancouver, British Columbia. So what is, is aimed here is to take full advantage of being at the crossroads of the North America marketplace and expanding that trade with Asian economies. So shippers use the Canada's Asia Pacific corridor because it provides access to ports up to three days closer to Asian hubs than any other major ports in the Americas. And it has a growing capacity to handle increased trade and has consistently shorter ports dwell times. It also utilizes a secure and efficient Canada-US border and transportation network. You can tell that all of these notes were provided to me by Transport Canada, and it feels a little strange to be you know, boasting, because that is really not a very Canadian trend. <laughs> <laughs> They're very excited about the interest in, in, her, in, their, in our corridor strategy. So to spur the development of our gateway strategies, Canada has made unprecedented commitments to ensure strong and efficient transportation infrastructure. And these commitments, and I think this is probably a really important point, have leveraged private sector investments across Canada to support international trade. I'm trying to see whether I'm on the right slide or not. This is the um, Prince Rupert um, container, and which is growing at quite a, and Prince Rupert is north, north British Columbia. And th there is a rail, road and utility corridor project underway in Prince Rupert. The project will provide road access and rail infrastructure on port property, along with utility services to 1,000 acres of land on Ridley Island in the port of Prince Rupert, and will provide the framework for future development of deep sea marine terminals for export of Canadian resources to meet the growing demand of Asian markets. So this project is a joint public and private sector investment so it involves and includes contributions from the Government of British Columbia, CN Rail, and the Prince Rupert Port Authority. So just to give you a sense of how these partnerships are being leveraged, there's about, been about a billion dollars of investment in the Asia Pacific Gateway and Corridor from the Government of Canada. And this leveraged an additional three and a half billion dollars in Western Canada to support international trade. So the projects associated with the Pacific, Asia Pacific Gateway include new bridges, road improvements, road rail grade separations, access roads to intermodal facilities, and short sea shipping berths. And the partnerships between all levels of government, private sector transportation leaders, and other stakeholders is really what's behind the growing success of the Asia Pacific Gateway. Uh, looking ahead, the gateway is <clears throat> aimed at ensuring that Canada is prepared to meet the long-term needs presented by the evolving patterns in global trade, and also, of course, to harness and the, the potential of Canada's natural resource economy and the exports that uh, we rely on for our own country's prosperity. So with sound frameworks and strong partnerships, and with infrastructure investments now being built and completed, 
The focus of our transportation system is now shifting increasingly from bricks and mortar to competitiveness measures like aligning policies and regulations, measuring gateway performance, and promoting and improving our outreach and marketing, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is a very short overview of what Canada has been doing with its Gateways and Corridors initiative um, since 2008. And um, we believe that with these kind of investments, the intermodal nature of them, and the fact that pretty well all the players are around the table advising our Minister of Transportation, that we are prepared to meet future challenges by leveraging these partnerships and, and also to continue to work um, in close cooperation with other levels of government, both provinces and municipalities. And of course, it's all aimed at enhancing the efficiency, the safety, and the security of our growing transportation system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cassie. Um, <clears throat> we have a few minutes for uh, any questions that you might have, and uh, there's a microphone right up here, and hopefully somebody will grab it and. Got it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Dan, uh, a couple weeks ago, the Journal of Commerce had a story quoting Hunter Harrison of uh, Canadian Pacific Railroad saying that within six years, the U.S. would have two transcontinental, transcontinental railroads rather than, you know, two eastern and two western railroads. So um, if he is accurate, what impact do you think that would have on the West Coast ports and their ability to ship cargo to the East Coast uh, without having to interline, you know, the, just have the one railroad uh, or two railroads uh, keeping all the, the revenue for themselves? I, I wouldn't expect to see a great big change. The, the amount of interlining that's done through Chicago um, has diminished over the years. Uh, we've now, because you've only got two railroads on each side, basically, I mean, KCS sort of disrupts things up from the south. But, um, the number of different combinations they have to work out is a lot less than it was, say, 30 years ago when we first started moving intermodal across the country. Um, and of course, the Canadian railroads go right through Chicago. Uh, so I think there's some efficiencies to be gained there. Um, the, there are issues to be resolved in just moving trains across Chicago and th through some of the gateways, regardless of who owns them on either side. They have some very uh, serious infrastructure uh, issues to work out as well there. And the other thing, it becomes uh, tougher for West Coast intermodal yards and ports to be able to load a whole train that's going to go all the way across the country to uh, specific East Coast markets. As a matter of fact, the railroads, both uh, BNSF and UP, have started doing intermediate blocking so they can build full trains out of West Coast ports, bring them to El Paso or another intermediate point, and then swap blocks back and forth. So now they have a full train to go off here and there. So some of that is already going on. There's opportunities to improve, but I think going from four railroads to two railroads, or six to three, or however many we do, I don't think you're going to see a big change. Well, speaking of... Uh, Port competitiveness. Uh, I think we should take other criterion, which is uh, 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 strike. You know, uh, port stability, and that's uh, we didn't talk about it. And uh, especially in the West Coast, here we're talking a port of LA and Long Beach. That's an issue. The second one, Prince Rupert. I mean, from Busan, South Korea to Prince Rupert is two days less than from Busan to uh, uh, LA. So and. Port productiveness, productivity, how many containers we handle per hour. Across from the ocean, from the Pacific, we have about 63 movements per hour. However, roughly speaking, we're talking about Long Beach, LA, probably 28, 30, sometimes 32. So we're way behind how those criteria will affect 
the port's competitiveness in the, in the, in the West Coast. I think that's a good question, and, and I think you know there there are so many variables as you mentioned when we talk about uh, you know whether it's port stability or port productivity. Uh, it's not a, a advertisement for the Journal of Commerce, but they they have, have have established the port productivity index, and so when we talk about 63 moves an hour in 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 Pusan or Hong Kong or Shanghai. Um, we have to, you know, determine the nature of that port. Is it a transshipment port? Is it a load center? Um, you know, what kind of uh, uh, labor do they have? Uh, uh, what are the labor rates and those types of things? So it, it's it's very difficult to compare apples to apples when you're looking at uh, different uh, types of ports, uh, what their functions are, whether the load centers or transshipment ports and those types of things. Um, I do agree that uh, obviously uh, it's incumbent upon the U.S. West Coast ports to um, work together to make sure that we have a productive workforce, that it embraces a, a new and upcoming technology, uh, so that it can compete uh, with uh, other port ranges, whether it be uh, the ports that Cassie referred to in the Pacific Northwest in Canada, or East Coast ports, or other ports in other ranges. So, uh, it, it, you know, I think you have to look at it from a system-wide approach. You need to have productive labor, you need to have uh, a very effective uh, rail rates. Uh, you need to have the inland infrastructure uh, that supports the, the movements of goods. And all those things combined makes you very, very competitive. If, they are, if you don't have all those elements working is when the, the fabric starts to, to pull apart a little bit. Let me add in um, maybe a little clarification. Uh, we aren't really in competition with the ports overseas. I mean, they don't have a choice of using the ports in Pusan or Singapore or Hong Kong or using the port of LA and Long Beach. We're really in competition with other North American ports. And there you'll find that the range of productivities are much, much tighter. Uh, now, you also mentioned strikes. Strikes scare customers more than anything else, more than money, more than anything else. You can talk to them all day about moves per hour, TEU per acre, which bridge you built. But if there's a strike on the horizon, that's scary, and they look for alternatives. Um, and we all have our problems. Right now, the uh, ILA in New York, New Jersey is suing the Waterfront Commission. Uh, they are about 350 laborers short every day. They had a terrible year last year. Um, so it's their turn at the moment. Now, it may come our turn here if we don't work out um, the differences here. Um, I don't know that we have any particular hot buttons on the West Coast right now with the uh, labor negotiations going up. It's amazing how quickly hot buttons can develop if people do not, you know, work it through. Uh, so we absolutely have to ensure a stable enough labor environment to keep customers comfortable. Um, but watch the, the numbers. When you, when you look at the numbers overseas with this here, that's not our competition. You guys have competition. <laughs> Phelps Hobart with the Navy League. Uh, I have too much, uh, I have a canal through Nicaragua. We won't touch on that, I guess. Uh, I thought some of the uh, carriers are uh, going slow steaming now. Uh, and we've, all we've talked about here is moving cargo as fast as possible. Uh, last but not, not least for Cassie, this is the question. Hey, you skipped the Keystone Pipeline. <laughs> uh, Let's uh, move oil through Canada to the coast, uh, but you don't want to do that, do you? Well, on that note, uh, <laughs> uh, it's a fair question, and uh, I, I'm getting the, the hook here from David. Um, but before um, we adjourn, I, I want you to please uh, thank our illustrious uh, group here, please. No. Not yet. Yeah, well, I want to thank you, Peter, for, uh, for moderating the panel here. Uh, this is great. Did I mention that uh, the Port of San Francisco is going to be the honoree tonight for their 150th anniversary? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, well, I think you can hear from that, uh, you know, that was only our first panel. This is going to be a pretty data-rich uh, symposium, I think. So uh, let's take a quick break and uh, come back so we can, uh, we can get on with the next panel on intermodal logistics. 
If uh, if that panel's in the room, would you kind of start making your way up here, please? Thank you.